Brothers and sisters, welcome to our worship hour this morning here in our Toronto church. I trust that you have come here with the intention to hear the word of God and that the Holy Spirit has touched your hearts and your minds and that the Holy Spirit will guide me and all of us as we open his holy word and continue our search for truth. You see, when we come to any text, any information, anything that is recorded, we always are looking for the meaning. When I'm in the class and teaching interpretation of the Bible, I tell the students, our business here in this class is to find the meaning. What is the meaning of the text? The purpose of life is actually also to find the meaning. Why do we live? What is the purpose of life? If you do not find meaning in any book you study or read, or in any profession you pursue, or for your whole life, if you don't ha have a meaning, then you have wasted your life, or you are wasting your life. So the purpose, the ultimate purpose of the church service and religious life is to find the meaning. So today we are here to find the meaning in the Word of God and what we should do today, how God wants us to conduct our life. This is the second part in a series, two-part uh, series of sermons on faith in God who creates, in faith in God the Creator. Last time I spoke about the biblical doctrine of creation, and how in the contemporary Christian world, there are many people who are undermining, wittingly or unwittingly, undermining the fundamental teaching of the Bible that God created the world in six literal days. Everything what we see, he created. And many today are challenging that belief, rejecting the doctrine of creation, or they are trying to accommodate it, to make it intellectually respectable, to be accepted in the scientific community and to say, well, yeah, it's true, God is the creator, but uh, the record of creation as recorded in the book of Genesis is not really, should not be understood literally, but we have to reinterpret it in the light of the scientific discoveries. Let me open the Bible and start. As you remember, we have looked into the book of Hebrews chapter 11, and let me today again read verse 6 but without faith it is impossible to please him God for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him now without faith you and I cannot please God it's impossible to please God without faith and what is that faith? Two things. First, that God is or God exists. We believe that God exists. We don't see God. No one has seen God, Bible says. But we, by faith, believe that God exists. Not without grounds, valid grounds. Second thing, we don't, not only believe that God exists, but we believe that God is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So God is not like a deistic concept, like a watchmaker who made a watch, you know, set it up and wound it up and let it tick. And he is not involved in this world. God is actively involved in this world. He cares about us, about our lives. He knows how many hairs we have on our head, right? He knows everything and he guides the history. He guides humanity. And everything that happens in this world is under God's control. So this is the God in which we believe. He exists and he is rewarder, which means there are consequences of the actions and the choices which, which we make in our daily life. There are consequences of actions and decisions we make in daily life. Now here we go a little bit further. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Now, when we come to this particular issue of God's existence and God's involvement in this world, as I mentioned, many today are attempting, 
from the Christian biblical, they profess the faith in the Bible, and at the same time they want to reconcile biblical account of creation with the uh, evolutionary concept of the origin of life. Now, from the very outset, I want to say, brothers and sisters, that we are not anti-scientific. Bible is not opposed to true science. God is the God who established the laws of nature, which are the object of scientific inquiry. God is the one who set up all these laws that govern the universe, who govern our body, physical, chemical, you know, comp uh, uh, world. So God is the one who is behind. So if you study sciences, this is not something going against God or against the Bible. But in the scientific inquiry, contemporary, you know, whatever, we have tendency to misinterpret reality, especially distant reality, distant things, you know, origin of the life, origin of the universe, origin of this earth, origin of human, or, or human beings, and so on. This is where science makes simply assumptions and they want to present it as a scientific fact, but these are simply speculations or assumptions. And we have to be very careful today not to buy into it and simply uh, surrender our ground, biblical ground, and I will show you what are the consequences if we begin to compromise and we want to accommodate biblical account and make it you know, palatable to the unbelieving scientific community. I'll give you, uh, actually I want to direct you, I will not in this sermon go into depth, but I want to direct you some, to some people who are scientists, who are Christian scientists, who are creationists, and who defend the biblical account of creation from scientific point of view. There is one, I mentioned his name before, you can find him on the internet, this is Stephen Mayer, a PhD, uh, st studied at Cambridge University, I mean, he has all the scientific credentials you can imagine, and he's a ding, you know, very persuasive uh, um, uh, presentations, and he's writing the books, and I will even use some of his statements about uh, how to say, uh, he's demonstrating actually that the contemporary evolutionary theory fails to explain the origin of biological form and information. So I will not repeat uh, everything what he says, but I just want to tell you, do your own research and you will find inadequacy and there is a questioning of the Neo-Darwinian evolutionary theory which is, which is also known as a modern synthesis. So modern Darwinians, I mean people, modern evolutionists, they are not following exactly Charles Darwin, what he taught, but they are called Neo-Darwinians. So there are some, you know, twists that they put to the Darwin's theory of evolution. But now there are facing challenges. And what are the challenges? There is explanatory deficiency of neo-Darwinism, origin of phenotypic complexity, origin of anatomical novelty, origin of non-gradual modes of transition, and also abrupt fossil appearance. So what is evolutionary theory saying? They are saying basically this, there is unguided natural selection acting on random mutation mechanism which can produce the appearance of design without being designed or guided in any way. So there is a natural, unguided natural selection and there is a genetic mutation, random genetic mutations. And when you put this together, then you're having evolution, uh, development of species. And what is quite interesting, uh, Richard Dawkins, who is well known and very militant evolutionist, he's saying, look, what is so, so amazing about Charles Darwin is that he, what did he do? He actually, when you look at the world as it is, a common sense tells you that there is a design. When you look at plants, you look at animals, you look at human beings, you see function and purpose and you see design. But the genius of Charles Darwin is that he was a counterintuitive. So he was, you know, coming up with a theory. No, this is not design. It came by chance. <laughs> you see, a common sense tells you when you see, you know, plant, you see the function, you see the color. You, can, you know, it's, it's amazing, intricate. But he says, no, 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 this is not you know, coming. This is not coming by design. It comes by chance. 
unguided natural selection and random mutations produce you know, this beautiful plant or produce human beings. But you see, this, this is not a lecture on theistic evolution or uh, biblical creationism. I just want to show you that, especially to younger generation, that you don't be intimidated when you go into a you know, classroom or university or when you read a book and when people you know, are presenting evolutionary theory as a fact and as a pure true science. So, evolutionary neo-Darwinian theory lacks creative power to bring about the changes that are observable in living organisms. They are saying also there is no theory of generative. I mean, leading scientists who are evolutionists are challenging traditional neo-Darwinian evolutionary theory. And I don't want to go into de details, but now what is the problem? We are having Christians who profess the faith in the Bible, and who are now trying to bring to the back door evolutionary theory through so-called theistic evolution. So what they are saying, yeah, that God is, the Bible is true, God created the world, but God was using evolution to create species. So God started to roll the ball and then he let it go. And it just came spontaneously, you know, life appeared and so on. Oh, Deborah Harsma and there is an institution called Biologos. She says, that evo thus evolution is a natural mechanism by which God providentially achieves his creative purposes. Gradual process of evolution was crafted and governed by God to create the diversity of all life on earth. Now, brothers and sisters, please don't dismiss or underestimate the dangers of these theories. These are Christians who are advocating evolutionary theory. They call it theistic evolution. Yeah, there is a God. Yeah, he is the creator, but he used evolution you know, to create species. Unguided natural selection and random genetic mutations. But this is false. Now, what Stephen Mayer says, look what he says, very interesting. At the same time, when evolutionary biologists openly express their concerns about the neo-Darwinian or contemporary evolutionary theory as lacking creative power, the professed Christian, Christians working in Christian science and science and faith institutions are urging folks in the church to accept the evolutionary mechanism as a means by which God creates. At the same time, when evolutionary scientists are challenging finding deficiencies in the new Darwinian theory, many Christian scientists want to sell evolutionary theory in the church. There is one uh, Christian man, Os Guinness, who wrote uh, a book, a very interesting book, and uh, it's called Grave Dig Digger Files. And in that book, what he wrote actually is the following, how Satan was looking for agents who, that would undermine the church. And they would come to church, I mean, scientific explanations, and they would like to... Uh, guide the church to be popular in the society, to be effective, to uh, appeal to the masses, to make the church grow. And what they're doing, they're making church programs appealing, you know. They're not so much focused on the Bible, on rational thinking, but they're more emotional, bringing new worship style, bringing new music style, bringing some, you know, theories that are palatable to the modern unconverted man, and then make the church grow. Grow. And then these new practices, worship styles, new theories will undermine the church and the church will be their grave diggers of the church. So don't focus on God, the creator. Don't believe in the account of Genesis. Don't uh, you know, focus on God who is God of justice. He's a God of love. He's a forgiving God. He's merciful. You know, everything goes. So these are the things that are coming in the churches and they are grave diggers of the church. And we have to be very careful about this and avoid this. Now, I don't want to uh, give you all the details, but let me just share with you a few thoughts here in regard to these um, dangers of this. Where is evolutionary theory failing? Uh, one is origin of genetic information. Mathematical challenges to neo-Darwinism. For example, people who are even atheists who do not believe in God 
uh, some scientists from MIT are saying no currently existing formal language can tolerate random changes in the symbol sequences which express its sentences. Meaning is almost invariably destroyed. So for example, if you have a text, any text that makes sense, uh, 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 makes sense and you randomly change the letters in their order, normally, ma uh, mathematicians, statisticians, they are saying you will not get meaning. You will destroy the meaning. You cannot have progression. There's something from that garbled text will, you know, develop and become more organized and better. So they're saying even from a mathematical point of view, it's unacceptable. And the second problem is the need for so-called epigenetic or ontogenetic information. The problem of the origin of information is unsolved in evolutionary theory. It's a problem. Information doesn't come only from DNA, but information is needed from other sources. They cannot explain where that information is coming from. And uh, for example, so there are alternative theories of origin. I will just mention to you post-New Darwinian evolutionary theories. For example, punctuated equilibrium, self-organizational theory, evolutionary developmental theory, epigenetic inheritance, natural theory, natural genetic engineering. They are trying to come up with other alternative theories that can explain where is the information coming from. But there are no satisfactory theories. So, without going into details, I just want to let you know that evolutionary theory, which is a major force to attack the account of creation in the Bible, is not standing on a firm footing, although they want to present it like that. And by the way, brethren, please keep in mind, when evolutionary theory came into existence, when Charles Darwin published his book, Origin of Species, in 1850s, right? What message came to this world in 1840s? Three angels' messages. The first angel's message is fear God and give glory to him because the hour of his judgment is come and worship him who created heaven, earth, and so on. So when God was about to give the message, three angels' messages, last message that direct people to God the creator and worshiping him on his holy day, Satan is counteracting his work. Brother Jim gave us this uh, Wednesday in the prayer meeting a very interesting study about uh, counter-reformation, <laughs> which was a Catholic reformation, but a counter-reformation, where they directly oppose the work of reformation. <laughs> so when God was about to give the last message to prepare the world for the second coming of Christ, Satan is sending his agents with an evolutionary theory to undermine the doctrine of God the Creator. So brethren, none of these alternative theories can explain where is the information coming from. I don't want to go too far, but I want to mention also another Christian man who is a Christian philosopher. His name is J.P. Moreland. And he also has a very interesting, wrote very interesting books where he is saying why today we as Christians are in danger, Bible-believing Christians who believe in the origin of, uh, of world as the Bible tells us. He said, the problem is that in the modern society, whatever is not scientifically verifiable is not accepted as knowledge. He says, this is outside of the plausibility structure. And what is a plausibility structure? The word plausibility, plausible, comes from the Latin word plaudere, which means to applaud, which means whatever is acceptable palatable, likable. So biblical things and faith are outside of this plausibility structure. I'll give you an example. Uh, if someone would come today and propose to hold a lecture that humans are contributing to the climate change, many people will say, well, I don't believe that, but I would be prepared to listen to the arguments, the evidence that that person has to propose that humans are contributing to the climate change. But now if someone would come and say, I propose to give a lecture in Toronto on the flat earth theory, I mean, not many people would come, right? Because it's not very plausible. It's outside of plausibility structure. So what we are finding today, it's so-called scientific naturalism. 
So what people are told in academia and whatever, whatever is not acknowledged or confirmed by hard sciences, it's not, you don't accept it. So you know, this is faith, this is not science. Bible is the faith, so faith, this is not scientific, scientifically proven. So you don't buy it. Now, I don't have time to talk about this, but this is a false theory. Why? Please remember one thing. Science cannot ultimately prove existence of God. Neither science can disprove existence of God. Science can point one way or another, but science is not ultimate test whether God exists or God doesn't exist. So you see, today many people are misled and the children in the schools, when teachers come and they say, oh, that's science. And if it's not according to science, then whatever is in the Bible is not, is not acceptable. This is wrong reasoning. Science can show us, you know, uh, many things that are true. But science cannot ultimately prove that there is God. But science can point to that. Now, some people want to use science to demonstrate that God doesn't exist, but they, they cannot use science in that way. It is completely impossible. So this is why we should not be intimidated by these people who are making such claims. And uh, I'll tell you what is very important to understand today, why people in the, are so divided. In the Seattle Times, not long ago, was published a syndicated article, A Nation Divided. And the author of that article said that in the United States, since, it, it, since Civil War, the nation has never been so divided as it is today. And, uh, you know, when you look, well, the, the author says, look, it is not the race, it is not the gender issue, it is not socioeconomic position that divides American society today. What divides the society, United States today, is the world view. <laughs> that is what divides the society. What do you believe is the ultimate reality? What do you believe we can know or not know? What is the origin of life? What is the purpose of life? You see, this is what we see, these differences, gender, race, whatever, this is the tip of the iceberg, but under that, there is a world view, fundamental view on the world that divides society. And today, we are entering into this battle, and we have to understand that this is a very serious ba battle. So we have to take biblical worldview, and then only then we can know the true reality. And uh, so let me just uh, jump a little bit further to if we apply theistic evolution to the uh, account of Genesis, first uh, 11 chapters of the Bible, what shall we get? Is it possible to reconcile the claims of the Bible with the claims of the modern evolutionary theory? You will see it's not possible. Now, as I mentioned, the theistic evolution is believed that God created the matter, and after that, he did not uh, guide it or intervene or act directly to cause any empirically de detectable change in the natural behavior of matter until all living things had evolved by purely natural process. Now, what is the consequence of such a view? Now, did God create Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? If you, are, if you believe in this. No. Because they believe that the human race developed, actually, Adam and Eve, from about 10,000 humanoid apes. And then, you know, somehow, God selected one pair. Now, this is, this is the, in reality what they believe. So all living beings have thus common, come not through direct creation by special activity of God, but by a random mutation they developed from lower or simpler forms of life. So there was no original couple from whom all human beings descended. Adam and Eve never existed, or if they existed, God picked those two from about 10,000 humans living on earth. 
Now, look 12, 12 consequences of this view. First, Adam and Eve were not the first human beings, or perhaps never existed. Adam and Eve were not created without parents, but were born of human parents, if you believe in theistic evolution. They descended from parents. God did not act directly or specially to create Adam and Eve, but out of the dust of the ground. This is thrown through the window. Four, God did not directly create Eve from the rib taken from Adam's side. This is also discarded. Five, Adam and Eve never, were never sinless human beings. You cannot have a sinless human being if you are having theistic evolution and gradual development, natural selection. You cannot have a <laughs> sinless human beings, Adam and Eve. <clears throat> Six, Adam and Eve did not commit the first human sin. Humans did exist doing evil before Adam and Eve, according to this view. Seven, human death did not begin as a result of Adam's sin. Of course, you are having natural selection. So some beings are dying and survival of the fittest. So death did not origin, originate with Adam and Eve, but existed before them. Eight, not all human beings descended from Adam and Eve. Thousands of humans existed before them. Nine, God did not directly act in the natural world to create different kinds of fish, birds, and land animals. Ten, God did not rest or cease from his work of creation after the six days of creation. The seven-day Sabbath has no origin at the creation of, the, of this earth. So you see, brethren, there are very serious consequences if we accept theistic evolution, that the six days of creation are not real days, that God did not create special species, and so on. Very serious consequences. And let me finish. 11, God did not, never created an originally very good natural world. And the last one, after Adam and Eve sinned, God did not place any curse on the world that changed the workings of the natural world and made it more hostile to human race. Now, these are the consequences of theistic evolution. The first 11 chapters of the Bible, you throw through the window. That's a myth and legend. You cannot rely on that. Now, don't underestimate the power of evolution if you try to merge it with biblical account. But now, you don't stop here. You have to go to other parts of the Bible because Jesus talks about Adam and Eve. Huh? When God created, when he was asked about divorce, what Jesus said? God created them too, right? And put them together. And what God has put together, men should not put asunder. So God, Jesus is directly quoting from the Genesis and taking this account as serious. So shall we, then we have to cut out in the New Testament and throw away portions of the New Testament because they are not in harmony with the scientific, scientific you know, theories. So the consequences are enormous. So this is why we have to discard this. And unfortunately, many good-meaning Christians are today accepting theistic evolution, which means, as I mentioned, yeah, God is the creator, but then we have evolution, so we put them together. And this is having very serious consequences. So I want you, brothers and sisters, to be very, very careful about this and not to buy into it. Now, the Bible says that God created the world in six literal days and that he rested in the seventh. And maybe you may say, but I'm not sure. I can, I can believe that. The science teaches differently. Now, let me ask you another question. Where is the root of the modern science as we know it? Isaac Newton, one of the greatest scientists in the world ever, firm believer in the Bible, when he discovered the law of gravity, he said, I believe that there is a God who put the law of gravity in place. Now, you are coming to modern age, you are having Stephen Hawking, who just died also, who was, you know, uh, Oxford and Cambridge scholar, and who is saying, because there is a law of gravity, there is no God. We don't need God, because there is a law of gravity. How this can be? Isaac Newton, there is a law of gravity, there must be a God, a lawgiver. Stephen Hawking says we have the law of gravity, we don't need God. 
absurd. Absurd. Now, when you ask the scientists, evolutionary and atheistic scientists, where did the laws of nature come from? You know what they say to you? We have no answer to that. This is a priori. These are questions that we don't ask. They exist. But the question is there. Where did the laws of nature come from? Who put the law of gravity there? No answer. A priori. Now, I mentioned Isaac Newton, Johannes Kepler, one of the founders, Galileo, astronomers, firm believers in Bible, Robert Boyle, founder of modern chemistry, firm Christ believer in Bible Christian, Michael Faraday, electromagnetism, firm believer in God and the Bible, Nikola Tesla, a son of an Orthodox priest. Look what Nikola Tesla wrote in My Inventions, originally published in 1919. The gift of mental power comes from God, divine being. And if we concentrate our minds on that truth, we become in tune with this great power, Tesla. My mother had taught me to seek all truth in the Bible. Therefore, I devoted the next few months to the study of this work. See, greatest inventors, scientists who founded modern science were firm believers in the Bible. They said, there is God. There is mind be behind this universe. Brothers and sisters, don't be intimidated, young people. If you're doing science that you, you cannot, you know, believe in the Bible. No. The more you discover the order and system in this universe the more you believe in rationality there is mind behind this universe god who created everything and he is our so science has its limits when it goes to the distant past and makes claims about some distant times that cannot be replicated in our time and empirically tested we need to be cautious we need faith now i mentioned last time that some methods of dating objects, material objects that are used today by modern science are not fully reliable because they deny the existence of catastrophic event like a flood that could have changed parameters how the world is and how it operates. So you see, there are some points where you need your faith will be tested. And, you know, in these points, we have to put our faith in God and God's word. Because I'll tell you why. Science is not God. Scientific discoveries and scientific truths can change over time. I remember when I was studying science to some extent, you know, back in Europe, and they, my teachers were atheists, but they were saying, look, science can develop and change and, you know, take different positions in the future when we have no more facts. So, you see, science cannot be taken as a last word because it's in development in progress. But now, if we do not have faith in God, we cannot please God. And this further means that we cannot obtain his righteousness. So, we, we spoke about that. Now, I'll give you a statement from Patriarchs and Prophets. I believe that uh, brethren can project it. Oh, we don't have the screen. Patriarchs and Prophets, <clears throat> page 111. <coughs> this is from the inspired source. <coughs> But the assumption that the events of the first week required thousands upon thousands of years strikes directly at the foundation of the fourth commandment. Hear that? Unbelief in the week of creation, belief that God needed thousands or millions of years to create everything, strikes at what? The fourth commandment. It represents the Creator as commanding men to observe the week of literal days in commemoration of vast, indefinite periods. So this is not one day, but they are in different, in different periods. This is unlike his method of dealing with his creatures. It makes indefinite and obscure that which he has made very plain. It is indefinitely in the, it's, it is 
infidelity, sorry, it is infidelity in its most insidious and hence most dangerous form. Its real character is to disguise that it is held and taught by many who profess to believe in the Bible. See? It is infidelity, this view that God needed thousands or millions of years, it's infidelity in its most insidious and hence most dangerous form. Its real character is so disguised that it is held and taught by many who profess to believe in the Bible. And this is exactly what I was speaking in the first part of the sermon. Brothers and sisters, this is a very dangerous view that strikes at the foundation of the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment, which points to God the Creator. Let me give you one more short statement from the same source, page 113, Patriarchs and Prophets. <clears throat> it is one of Satan's devices to lead the people to accept the fables of infidelity, for he can thus obscure the law of God in itself <clears throat> very plain and embolden men to rebel against the divine government. His efforts are especially directed against the fourth commandment because it so clearly points to the living God, the maker of the heavens and the earth. <clears throat> In the Dark Ages, people were prohibited to study the Bible. They were put, you know, in the prison or stake. So there was, they call it Dark Ages, oppression, persecution, no free, free investigation. Now we are living in enlightened age. You heard about that. Age of freedom, of thinking, no limitations. But I am challenging you, go in any public educational institution and try to teach biblical account of creation. And you will, happen what will, you will see what will happen to you if you are a teacher. Try to do it. Brothers and sisters, this is a spiritual thing. This is not just ordinary thing. There is such sustained, vicious attack on anyone who dares to defend the biblical account of creation and present it as a scientific theory. You, if you are a professor, if you are a scientist, your credentials can be taken, your professorship revoked, your grants for scientific research, you know, taken. It's, it's, Un unbelievable enmity of Satan against the biblical account of creation. And not without reason. When, say, when you see such resistance, you know for sure there is a reason for that. And this is part of the end game. <clears throat> now let me share with you Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> the first angel's message. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. This is the first angel's message. Who should we worship? God the Creator. What is the third angel's message? If any man worship the beast and receive his mark, what is the mark of the beast? False day of worship, right? What is the seal of God? The true day of worship, seventh day. See, by keeping the Sabbath, the seventh day, you today, and I profess the faith in God, the Creator, It's a worship issue. Last battle is our worship. Who do you worship? Do you worship the true God, creator, or do you worship the false God? That's a test, and this is why the battle is so fierce, an attack, so cruel. But then we have a choice. In Romans chapter 1, Apostle Paul in the New Testament is defending the doctrine of creation. In John chapter, in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, Brother Dami read this text for us. 
What did he say? Can we know God? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So brothers and sisters, do we have evidence about God's existence and God's power and wisdom? Where? In the things that are created, are clearly seen, that they are without excuse. Do you think these scientists will be able to one day say to God in the judgment, God, we are sorry, but all our scientific evidence pointed that you don't exist? Do you think there will be a defense to them available? No. From created things, it is clearly seen. All these things about God, his existence, his power, and God and his wisdom. And then we come to Hebrew 11.6. So 11.6 says what? We are ahead of this verse. Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently see him. So God gave evidence about his existence through the created world. And how do we diligently seek, seek God? We seek God by studying his word and obeying his word. This is the way how we seek him. Now, if you go to Psalm 19, verse 1 to 3, you can find the same thing. Psalm 19. I ask our children to memorize these verses. These are very important verses. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech, no language, where their voice is not heard. Amen. Heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Brothers and sisters, should we be in dark about God's existence and his wisdom? And let's see how was God creating. How was God creating this world? Genesis 1-3, what does it say? In the beginning, you know, God said, God created heaven and earth. And how? God said, let there be light. And there was light. So God spoke. That's right. Look, Genesis 1-6 and 7. God said, let there be firmament in the midst of waters, and let it divide the waters from waters. And it was so. 1-9, God said, let waters under heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. So God commanded, God said, and it was so. It just happened. Voice command. God creates by voice command. You know, this is amazing. This last week I was reading a little bit about uh, human nature and human language and human consciousness. You know, what is very interesting, rational beings cannot exist without language. You cannot think rationally without language. You need words. Now, just think about that. Can you think anything meaningful without language, without words? And among philosophers, uh, philosophy of language is a branch of philosophy that was developed a lot in the 20th century, and they, di they discovered, even as scientists and philosophers, that language is very important for rational thinking. Now, <laughs> so you see, you cannot think, you cannot be aware of yourself without language. Language words are extremely important. And when you come to the Bible, what do you find? In the beginning, God created, and God said. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was what? The word, information, logos. See, this is how God creates. God speaks. That word, we do, which is identified with Jesus Christ, we don't know exactly this wisdom of God, you know. But the word, intelligence, information is there. It's a, it's a basis of life. God speaks and creates. Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake, it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Wow! This is the biblical teaching how God creates. 
But now if you go to the New Testament, you can see which, why the doctrine of creation is so important. Because doctrine of creation is directly connected with doctrine of salvation or recreation. How? Let me show you. From the New Testament, the life and works of Jesus Christ. Let's go to Matthew 8.8. 8. Jesus is healing people. There is a Roman centurion who has a sick servant. Centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come unto my, under my roof. Speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. Do you see that faith? He understood the power of God, that God can only speak and create or recreate, restore. That's faith. Jesus said he didn't find such faith in Israel. Now, I'll give you another example. Mark, verse 4, 39 and 40. They're on the sea, on the lake of Galilee. There is a storm. How is Jesus coming the storm? He speaks. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is that ye have no faith God speaks and comes the storm God speaks and brings in things into existence God's word has creative and recreative power this is why the doctrine of creation is so important for us now look another example mark 11 Jesus Christ is hungry he's walking in the morning you know in the countryside he sees a fig tree he's looking for the figs he wants to eat and there are only leaves, and Jesus curses the fig tree. That same day in the afternoon, they are coming, or day after, they are coming back, and the fig tree dried up. <laughs> so this is in Mark 11, 14, and Jesus answered and said unto, unto it, No man eat fruit of thee thereafter ever forever. Hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Verse 20. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, said to him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursedst is withered away. And Jesus answering and said unto them, Have faith in God. Jesus speaks, comes the storm. Jesus speaks, the fig tree is dried up. Jesus speaks, a man is healed. Word of God. Powerful powerful do we believe that do we believe that you see brothers and sisters God is rewarder of them that diligently see him Abraham believed to God and it was counted to him for righteousness Now, do you believe God? Do you believe God the Creator? Amen. <laughs> now, think about this. God is the rewarder. How did he reward Abraham? It was counted to him for righteousness. Now, let me ask you a question. Is this a good reward if God counts you as a righteous person? Camille, if God would say to you today, Camille, I count your faith to righteousness. You are a righteous person before me. I accept you as my child. Would that be very good to hear today? Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, what in this world can be of greater value to you and to me than to hear this counting God, counting us as righteous? What did Jesus say to people? Seek ye first what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things will be added to you. Did God bless Abraham with material goods? Of course. But he was seeking righteousness of God first. If you look people who please God, they always sought spiritual blessings first and God blessed them otherwise. Look at Jacob. What was Jacob looking for? Birthright. It's just spiritual blessings. His brother, what he was looking for? His appetite, right? Stomach, food. And he lost the birthright. How about, 
How about Solomon? What did he ask? Wisdom. But God blessed him also in other ways. You see, brethren, we should seek God, his righteousness, know him, trust him, believe him, believe his word, and God will bless us in so many ways. I will finish here. I have more, but I will finish here. Brothers and sisters, I want to strengthen your faith. We are living in an age of infid infidelity. This is godless age. Jesus said, when the Son of Man will come, shall he find what? Faith on earth. See, faith in the Word of God. God the Creator. God who created everything in six days. God who today speaks and brings into existence, restores, brings healing, brings righteousness, forgives our sins. This is the God in whom we believe. And we as Seventh-day Adventists and Reformers, we should affirm this truth today. Because this is the three angels' messages. We proclaim this faith in God the Creator. And in the Sabbath day, as a special sign of God who can make us holy. See? God will have 144,000 people who are overcomers. If I don't believe that God can create in six days, how can I believe that he can give me victory over sin and perfection of character? How can I believe that? You see the con connection between creation and recreation? If we don't, some people say, well, I haven't uh, seen a person who has completely overcome. Don't say that. Sister White says, if you say I cannot overcome, you will be surely lost. Believe that God can give you power. Let me read my last verse <laughs> for today. And this is in the book of Jude. And this is the God, the Creator. Uh, just a second. I can go directly to Jude. And you will see how this is so beautifully connected. <clears throat> Verse 24, Jude 24. Now to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Thank you, Brother Walter, for this presentation.